I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows me to express uh, certain important things today. Uh, I'm taking this issue, the reading of Fatiha behind the Imam as a study case to understand many issues. For example, the attitude of our scholars of the past versus the attitude of our scholars today. Uh, the lack of understanding priorities. Uh, the hashing out of issues that have already been completely debated and conclusions have already been made. Um, so, so let me, uh, so I'm using this issue and I'll be using other issues as time goes by as an example to show the, um, the, the lack, uh, the lack of intelligence. Uh, and uh, how we have been caught, the Muslim Ummah, not just uh, the scholars, but the Muslim Ummahs have been caught on uh, issues of fiqh, how we have been caught in Islamic legalisms. So one of the most important legal issue is the reading of Fatiha behind the Imam, because if you, according to some opinions today, not previously, and I'll show this to you, and this is very important to understand because I'm going to actually go through the entire debate back and forth, one opinion to the next opinion to one opinion to the next opinion. And I, I don't know how long I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this for a little while until, you know, I feel uh, that I have established the fact that, look, there there is no 100% conclusion one way or the other. Okay? So now, uh, regarding Fatiha, uh, so, so how is the Ummah reacting? Okay, so the past is, this is how it was, the Imam Abu Hanifa says, which is going to be an interesting case to look at, but he says, if the Imam, the Imam is reading Fatiha for you in any of the five prayers, then you don't have to read Fatiha because he did it for you. Okay, this is one opinion. And the second opinion is if Imam Shafi'i who says that you have to read Fatiha in every single rakah, in every single prayer, whether you the Imam recites it out loud or doesn't recite it out loud, you have to recite it, no matter what. Imam Malik has the opinion that's between these two, which is that if Fatiha is read out loud by the Imam, you don't have to read it out loud. Okay. And uh, if the Imam doesn't read it out loud, like in Zuhur or Asr, uh, then you have to read Fatiha on your own, okay? And so these are the three basic opinions. Uh, now, the scholars have been arguing for centuries, uh, regardless, now this has, you know, become one of the main issues that, uh, you know, La Salah, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and there are basically many narrations, but two basic fundamental narrations on these issues, or I'd say three, but two I'm going to bring up right now. One is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنِ When the Qur'an is recited, right, فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Then recite, listen to it. وَأَنْسِتُ And be quiet. And the other is the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَا صَلَاةَ لِمَا لَا يَكْرَهُ فَاتِهَةُ الْكِتَابِ there is no salah for the one who didn't read the the Fatiha Tul Kitab, the, the, the Surah, Sutul Fatiha. Okay? So we're going to look at all these issues in detail. But what I want to first highlight is how the ulama are treating this issue uh, versus, because this is an issue uh, that has been debated from the beginning. Uh, but it is being brought forth by our scholars as if, you know, this is a do and die situation for us, okay? And and I don't mean this as a disrespect to any of the scholars, but only that, uh, you know, uh, that there is a lack of understanding amongst Islamic scholarship of the other opinion, okay? And so what I'm trying to do is bring the opinions together without giving, oh, this one's right and that one's wrong. No, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help you understand the other side, okay? Because when you don't understand the other side, you think that only your side is right and the other side has no arguments. Like, how dumb can they be, right? And so, this type of attitude is the attitude that I want to stop, okay? So now, Let's look at some of the contemporary scholars, how they have dealt with this 
issue of reading Fatiha behind the Imam. Then I will start uh, by my own... Okay, no. Then I will actually read to you from the opinion of one of the great scholars of the past. Okay, how they discussed the issue. Okay, and then after that, I will discuss my own to and fro, one argument to the next argument, for argument, against argument, for argument, against argument, and I will do this for a little bit of uh, time. And the Imam recites Surah Al-Fatiha. Do I have to recite it too, even though I said Amin already? According to the more right view, and based on the multiple ahadith, sound and profound ahadith, that the Imam and the Ma'moon, whether you are praying in Jama'ah or sing, every person in a loud prayer or in a prayer without sound, every person should recite Surah Al-Fatiha on their own. And any prayer in which the person does not recite Surah Al-Fatiha is khidaj, is deficient, is not complete is invalid according to many of the scholars based on their understanding of the hadith. But let me make it simple for you. If you pray behind an imam who after recites Surah Al-Fatiha, he gives you time to recite it on your own, then you should recite it. This is in the loud prayer. If he doesn't and you said Ameen, then don't bother. It should be sufficient. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وصحة. But in a prayer without sound, we call it a silent prayer, ظهر, and in عصر, and in the third ركعة for المغرب and third and fourth ركعة for عشاء, you should recite سورة الفاتحة on your own. And don't tell me I'm Hanafi, or I don't do this because we have a sound hadith. Every person should recite Surah Al-Fatiha on their own. In the loud prayer. If the Imam doesn't give you a chance, then his recitation is a recitation for you because at least you heard it. There was Sama'a. But in the secret prayer, he did not hear the Imam reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. You just stand up there doing what? Wandering around? Uh, there, is a, there is a hadith. This is Sahih hadith. The Salat of a person who does not recite Fatiha is not valid. But all these hadiths are, some of these hadiths are Sahih and some of their chains are weak. And in all these Sahih narrations, this is general. La Salata لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب as we mentioned in Bukhari, Muslim, in almost every book of hadith. But wherever this hadith has been reported with a sahih narration, it's confined it just to this bit. La salata liman lam yaqra bi fatiha til kitab. Whosoever does not recite fatiha, his salat is not valid. This is general. And Imam in, in Tirmazi, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah is reported to have said, this is this hadith, liman yusalli wahda. For whosoever prays individually. Other people say, look, you pray salat, in Jamaat, and but you don't recite Fatiha, your Salat is not valid. The Prophet is saying, if you don't pray Fatiha, your Salat is not valid. But this is not what the Hadith is saying. There is another Hadith about, by, Ubadah, by Ubadah ibn Samit, radiallahu ta'ala, and he mentioned Abu Dawud in other books of Hadith, with the addition that where, where they were told, لا تفعلوا إلا بفاتحة الكتاب Don't do anything, in other words, don't recite anything behind the Imam except Fatiha. And all such variations, this hadith of Ubadah bin Samad has also been mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, without the final addition, and, and wherever it is mentioned as being prayed behind the Imam, all such narrations are debated and considered as da'if. And other ulama have refuted them. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, here again, what the Sahaba don't do, we know it is matruk. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala did not use to recite Fatiha behind the Imam. Umar radiallahu ta'ala used to get angry at people who used to recite behind the Imam. Ali radiallahu ta'ala did not use to recite behind the Imam. And in Muatta Imam Malik, there is a hadith by Jabir bin Abdullah. Jabir bin Abdullah, in, again in Tazkirat al-Hufad, Allama Shamsuddin Zahbi rahmahullah has written, he was the Grand Mufti of Medina. He participated in the Battle of Badr and he embraced Islam when the Prophet ﷺ was still in Mecca. 
and he met the people in Mina when the people gave the Prophet وسلم, their allegiance. So he had embraced Islam before Hijrah. He grew up in Medina and he participated in the Battle of Badr. And one night, it says in Tazkiratul Ufad, the Prophet وسلم, caught a camel from Jabir bin Abdullah. And in response to that, the Prophet gave him dua for maghfira 25 times. He says 25 times the Prophet وسلم, prayed for his forgiveness. Can you imagine how fortunate he must have been? And then he, he died in the year 78 year after Hijrah. Lived for almost 70 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that time, there were many a great scholars in Medina, many among Sahaba, many among Tabi'een. And he remained the big Mufti of Medina. In Watta Imam Malik, which Imam Shafi Ramahullah has stated, the most authentic book on the surface of the earth, long before even Imam Bukhari was born, in Kitab Salah, on the authority, Imam Malik Rahmahullah has recorded the Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said man salla raka'atan whosoever prays one raka'at wa lam yaqraw fiya bi fatihati al-kitab wa lam yaqraw fiya bi umm al-quran and who doesn't recite surah fatiha umm al-quran is the other name for the surah fatiha and whosoever prays one raka'at does not pray surah fatiha in that raka'at fa lam yusalli he has not prayed illa wara al-imam unless he is behind the imam because there are many other narrations in which the Prophet ﷺ has said, Man kana lahu imamun faqira, bir imam lahu qira'a, with slight variations. Whosoever prays behind the imam, then the recitation of the imam is sufficient. Or the imam is sufficient for you to recite. If you have an imam, recitation of the imam is sufficient. So this big mufti of Medina, in the presence of many a sahaba and tabi'een, he would give the fatwa, you, when you are with the Imam, then you don't have to pray Fatiha. One of the pillars of the Salah is to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in each rak'ah. In each rak'ah. Liqawli al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fi hadith, more than one place, authentic, mutawatir, من لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب فصلاته خداج 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 If you pray and you do not recite al-fatiha in each salah then your salah is invalid is invalid is invalid طيب This applies to your individual salah we don't have a problem with it You pray by yourself حتى قرأ بكل ركعة بالليل with each rak'ah you recite what? Al-Fatiha. And also applies to the silent salahs. What do you mean by a silent salah? Salat al-Dhuh wa Salat al-Asr. Tsalli khalf al-Imam. Wa in kan al-Ahnaf yarawn aydan in qiraat al-Imam tujzi' an al-Ma'mu. Wa lakin al-Jumhur yagul hi that the majority of the jurors they say you pray behind the Imam. It's a silent salah. In each rak'ah you recite Al-Fatiha. We don't have a problem. Also, if the salah is made of three units, rak'ah ziyani, or four, we don't have a problem with the last one or the last two. Salat al-Maghrib, the third rak'ah, it's silent. The problem which we have here, where the issue is, is when the imam recites loud. And this is in al-Fajr, in the two rak'ahs, al-Isha in the first two, and al-Maghrib in the first two. Huh? Now what are you going to do? What do you mean what are you going to do? في حديث أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه والحديث في الصحيحين The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he is to lead the salah الحديث في الصحيحين when he is to lead the salah he would say الله أكبر and then he would be silent for a while a duration of time. And then he starts, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik, Yawm al-Din, Iyaka, Na'abudu, Iyaka, Nasta'in, Udin al-Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Al-Fatiha, and then, Wala al-Dalleen, and then what? Ameen. And then right away, Yaqra'a. He begins what? Reciting the Qur'an. And then he would stop, a pause, 
And then before he says, Allahu Akbar, he would bow down. For Abu Hurairah, Jaa al Nabi, Abu Hurairah came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said to him, Bi Abi anta wa ummi ya Rasulallah. May my father and my mother be sacrificed for you, Messenger of Allah. Hada yani ta'bir hubbi ya ikhwa. Taskutu sakdatayn. You pass twice in the salaw. Mada taqul. ذكر دعاء الاستفتاح وفي الثانية حتى يفصل التكبير عن الإيه عن القرآن. الشاهد the important thing this hadith tells you that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not pause after ولا الضالين آمين. هذا الحديث يثبت هذا الموضوع. النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم did not give the imam a chance to recite al-Fatiha. He's bringing up this point because Imam Shafi'i requires that, and you have must have, maybe some of you must have experienced this. Imam Shafi'i requires that after Ghayr al Maghdubi alayhim al Dalin, and then then there is the Imam stays silent in the Shafi'i uh, Mazhab, okay? And you must have heard people after the Fatiha, people start reading Fatiha themselves individually. Maybe you experienced this or didn't. Uh, so he's talking about the fact that that is wrong, uh, that uh, that the Prophet did not pause between the Surah and Fatiha. Okay, so this is a separate issue, but it has to do with Fatiha in the sense that Imam Shafi, because he requires it, so he asks in his Mazhab after Ghayr al Maghdubi Ali, Amin, then the Imam stays quiet, so the Muqtadi, the people behind the Imam, can finish their prayers. Okay, by the way, Imam Zaid over here, me and him used to speak together at uh, the Iswa Masjid in Maryland for, I think it was a year or two, we used to be the two speakers in that small little masjid. Um, anyway, so this is what Imam uh, Zayd Abdul Karim is saying. So now. And we what? went into what? The Quran. <coughs> but now how are you going to deal with this, with this, when you're... If you do not recite al-Fatiha, then your salah is invalid. When you're also commanded, فَإِذَا قُرِئَ وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ And when the Qur'an is being recited, you're supposed to do what? نصوص ظاهرها فاختلف أهل الهل The jurist differed over this issue. القول الأول The first view وهو قول أبي حنيفة what did they say? Qira'atul imami tujzi'u an qira'atik. The imam pays off for you. هذا هو القول الثاني. الأول. القول الثاني that you must come up with it. وفي حديث الحديث that I just quoted. حديث صحيح مسلم. Listen to this. الحديث في صحيح مسلم but this is the wording of الإمام النسائي قال أبو هريرة أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه says قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says من صلى صلاة لم يقرأ فيها بأم القرآن فصلاته خداج 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 whosoever prays a rak'a يعني صلاة rak'a and he does not recite الفاتحة his صلاة is invalid 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 اسمع اسمع هذه فقالوا يا أبا هريرة they said يا أبا هريرة إنا نكون خلف الإمام ولا يدع لنا فرصة للقراءة شايف النص فين في الصميم يا طيب قتل هذا we pray behind the Imam and the Imam because the Imam follows the hadith that I just quoted. Who is it? The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to to pass with at the beginning and at the end. Hadith Samar ibn Jundub Saktatayn. This is hadith. This is munkar. There is another hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood. This is hadith munkar. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pause after the Fatiha to give a chance for the Imam to recite. This is hadith munkar. It's not correct. Oh, so the hadith which we're dealing with here, which is authentic, that. At the beginning and at the end, there is no chance. فهذا هو قول الصحابة يقول إننا نكون خلف الإمام. We are behind the Imam, and he does not let us or have a chance. He right away goes into the قراءة, into reciting the Quran to say the Fatiha. What did Abu Hurairah say to him? Huh? 
اقرأ بها في نفسك recite it silently يعني حتى والقرآن بيقرأ فthis is the second view the third view which is very interesting they say and, and they use analogy and it's correct analogy القياس مش في كل الأحيان يستخدم but look at this they say if you come to the salah and you arrived late and you found the imam in the ruku' in the ruku' Allahu Akbar ruku' and you quote the ruku' you quote the imam at the ruku' the question is is your rak'ah valid or not man adrak al rak'ah khal ruku' khalas by the way maybe some of the brothers do not know this yani uh, subhanallah they, 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 if you catch the imam in the ruku' Allahu Akbar and then Allahu Akbar خلاص, you quote the rak'ah did you recite the fatiha but your rak'ah is valid if you pray behind an imam who allows you a duration of time to recite the Fatiha, go ahead and recite the Fatiha. If he does not, you have two choices. Recite it secretly, quickly, or leave it, your Salah is valid. Clear? Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allahu Khaira. Subhanallah, yani, uh, in this context, and I close with this, inshallah. بعض الإخوة بيأتوا للصلاة أنا I notice this in the community here and maybe it's worthy of mentioning بيأتي الأخ مع الإمام and he knows that if he did not So now Imam Zayn actually did a pretty good job He was much more broad in explaining the issue of a reading Fatiha behind the Imam Now I want to take a deeper look especially in the Hanafi versus the Salafi debate. Imam Malik is in the middle because he says if the Imam's reading it out loud, you can just, you have to listen. If he's not reading it out loud, then like in Zuhr prayer or Asr prayer, you just read Fatiha too. Uh, you don't have to read. I mean, if, if the Imam is reading it out loud, you don't have to read. And if the Imam is silent, then you have to read. This is Imam Malik's position, okay? Now, uh, so now let's first start with understanding that. Now I'm going to help you understand a few basic points. Number one, there is the issue of what is the le what do we mean by a legal position? <clears throat> by a legal position, we mean what is the minimum you have to do to let whatever issue is, and in this case, it's reading Fatiha. What is the minimum you have to do for your your salah by reading Fatiha to be valid or whatever position? What is the minimum you have to do to attain the validity of whatever your whatever the issue is? Okay, so this is what we mean by Islamic law. So you can do more than the minimum, and so for example, the Hanafi scholars that say you do not have to pray Fatiha behind the Imam. Uh, like uh, Imam Muhammad, for example, he, uh, he uh, says that if you did read Fatiha, it's fine because we don't uh, disagree with uh, praying Fatiha behind the Imam. We just say it's not the minimum. It's not a minimum. The minimum requirement is you can stay silent, and then there your Fatiha is valid. Okay. Now again, let us review why I'm going through this. I'm going through these debates and these issues because I want to show you that these are things that were settled via the different schools of thoughts in Kufa, uh, via Abu Hanifa, in Medina, via Imam Malik, 
and uh, uh, via uh, Egypt, you can say uh, Egypt via Imam Shafi'i, and these are places where the companions of the Prophet were. They had these opinions, and then these different opinions became schools of thoughts. And so the, my point of saying that is that while you can do hair splitting and try to reach the absolute truth of an issue, uh, but we've already debated these issues for 1,400 years, so it's probably a lot more safer and a lot better. You just stick to one of the schools of thought that could even be the Salafi thought that is the traditional Salafi thought, not the neo-Salafi thought, and uh, or one of the four schools of thoughts or other even, like for example, uh, if you take Imam Ibn Hazm, for example, or uh, the Zaydi, the Shia, for example, the Zaydi school of thought, this is all fine, okay? Now, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the issues have been so argued that to now act like you now have an opinion and it is the only valid opinion and all the other opinions are invalid is an incorrect uh, attitude and this is one of the things that's haunting us today and that is that we feel like this one fiqhi opinion that I have and me and my sheikh have or my mazhab is the only val is the only one that has a valid opinion no our scholars of the past have always maintained that even though we think our opinion is right right uh, that uh, but يحتمل بالخطاء but there is a chance of being wrong and even though our opponent meaning the people that disagree with our opinion they are uh, they are they, they they we feel that they are wrong but uh, it's possible that they have the truth okay and uh, so the point is the difference in the attitude okay the difference in the attitude was the scholars of the past when they talked they talked okay this is one opinion and these are the reasons of this opinion and this is the other opinion and this is the reason for this opinion and this is the third opinion and this is the reason and they would give and elaborate and then come to a conclusion rather than just oh the prophet said this and that's it and i'm not able to or able to listen to any other opinion now uh the first issue now, the second thing I want you to help you appreciate is the intricacies and the the depth of the uh, of the Islamic law. Okay, so I'm also helping you. I want to help you also see that. Okay, and that is that uh, the first issue that will come up is that who has to prove what? Who has to? Who is the one who has to prove something? So if Someone says the muqtabi, the people behind the imam, have to read Fatiha. Is it the one who says, like in the case of, of the Hanafis, have to prove that no, we don't have to read Fatiha? Or the people that say, yes, you have to read Fatiha, they have to prove you have to read Fatiha. So the, uh, the opinion that is almost agreed upon in general by Asuli principles, by principles of of how you prove something or who has to prove something is that the person who says something has to be done the onus is on them the proof of burden is on them to prove that this XYZ has to be done okay now having said that so now uh, let us start the uh, the deeper debate okay so the issue is is reading Fatiha for itself does reading Fatiha, is reading Fatiha for Now, uh, one group of scholars will say that yes, reading Fatiha is absolutely compulsory. You have to read Fatiha. Now, uh, the, Quran, the Hanafis will say, the Hanafi school of thought or similar schools of thought, they will say that it is not compulsory to read Fatiha in any of the Rakaat. Yes, the Prophet said, "La salat aliman yakrahu fatiha al kitab." I will explain how you can look at that, or how some of the scholars look at that from a asuli perspective, because the Prophet saying something, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, does it make it fault? Does it make it compulsory? When the Prophet says, "There's nothing except this," is it a recommendation? Is it an encouragement? Does it make it uh, 
it, it, like almost like imperative but not far meaning it is necessary but not far it makes it a pillar of salah but not uh, at the level where everyone has to do it now let us look at this issue if i say uh, do you have to do sujood in salah you say yes you have to do sujood and, and then the answer is look the quran says warka'u wasjudu do ruku and do sujood okay if you say that do you have to do uh, do you have to stand up in prayer for example um uh, you know layla illa so standing up in prayer is mentioned in quran okay if you say uh, that uh, do you have to do uh, salams so the quran says uh, about the salams upon the prophet وسلم, which we do in the end of the prayers if you say uh, do we have to read uh, any quran then the Quran says, "Bakra'u ma tayassara min." Read from the Quran of any portion you like. This is what the Quran says. So, the since majority of the pillars of salah are found within the Quran, according to the Hanafi opinion, therefore, if the if it is not in the Quran, meaning it is not in the Quran to read Fatiha, which will come to one verse uh, that. Uh, the, the some of the scholars have taken it to mean the, the repeating of the the seven repeated verses of the Quran is referring to Fatiha, and then Imam Shafi and the other scholars will take that uh, narr that narration, but that's a hadith uh, referring to an ayah of the Quran, which in the Mazhab of Imam of Imam Shafi, when you take a hadith that's directly referring to any ayah of the Quran, he considers both the hadith and the ayah equal, whereas Imam Abu Hanifa does not. Okay, so now, uh, now, um, so now the issue is okay. So Fatiha, the reading of Fatiha is not mentioned in Quran. Okay, so now the issue is uh, the reading of Fatiha is not mentioned in Quran itself. Okay, what to speak of the issue which we're talking about, which is the issue of reading Fatiha behind the Imam. Okay, so this is one opinion. Uh, the other opinion is that I mentioned the ayah and the Quran are of equal status. This is the opinion of Imam Shafi. Okay, so what does Imam Shafi do? Is he so? About the Audh Billahi min al-Shaytan al-Rajim. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Walakad atayna ka sab'am min al-mathani." O Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we have given you seven okay we have given you seven often repeated verses of the quran wal quran and azim and the great quran now this ayah itself has many different interpretations but i'm only going to restrict the interpretation to the issue that we are talking about now uh, so the some of the scholars will take that uh, the seven often repeated verses this is the proof that you have to read Fatiha. Each individual behind the Imam has to read Fatiha. Other scholars will say, no, this is just mentioning that these are the seven repeated verses that are read over and over again. And they are saying that you have to read it behind the Imam is no such proof as such. It's not proof of reading Fatiha behind the Imam as such. Okay, so... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الْحَظِيمِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنِ And when the Qur'an is recited. Now, قُرِئَ is نَكِرَ It's uh, meaning it is not specific, being specifically mentioned for salah. But many scholars, especially the fuqaha, have taken this, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنِ And when the Qur'an is recited, meaning when it is recited in salah. They mean they mean it to mean when it is recited in salah. Wa idha qori al Quran, and then the other scholars they say no, this is not for salah. So this is wa idha qori al Quran, and when the Quran is recited, fa an lahu, then listen to it careful, carefully, and not only that wa an situ, and so it's saying don't listen to it carefully. Was fa stamiu lahu wa an situ, and don't say anything while the Quran is being recited. So, this, uh, you know, Imam Shafi'i's mazhab where you have to read Fatiha, even if the Imam is Bil Jahar, is reading out loud, this uh, calls, this uh, uh, this leads to polemics in, in, in that situation. Uh, be quiet. So you may have mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being here 
is this ayah if, actually favors any of the mazhabs. It probably favors Imam Malik's mazhab, which is that if the Quran is out loud, you listen to it. And if it is not out loud, then you can read it. It's allowable. Okay? Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ تَدَرَّ وَخُفِيَ and this actually, uh, remember Allah in your own self, meaning you can read, and this is in Imam, Imam Malik's Muwatta, you can read Fatiha in your heart as the uh, Imam is reading uh, Fatiha. You can also read Fatiha along with him in your heart. Okay? Wa idha quri al Quran. So the idea that you have to absolutely, and, and especially, you know, I'm not attacking, but I'm just mentioning as a point of reference the, the opinion that the Salafi brothers have that. Uh, you, and in fact, Imam, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah didn't even have this opinion. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah considered it better to stay quiet if uh, the Imam is reading it out loud. Um, uh, now, the, the, some of the Salafi brothers have the opinion, you absolutely have to read Fatiha no matter what. Well, if Qur'an is being recited out loud and the Imam is reading it out loud, clearly from the Nas of Qur'an, right? Uh, it shows that it is better to stay quiet. Okay, so uh, so I just want to mention that. And the point here is not who is right and not who is wrong, but it is to simply show that uh, there can be more than one valid opinion when it comes to legalities. This is why we have many schools of thought. And then there are some people, they are so ridiculous, so dumb, that they think that their legal opinions is about when the Prophet says all of them are in the hellfire except for one because I follow this way and this way is the correct and they're all in the hellfire, they're all in the wrong way except for the opinion that I follow. Now, let us inshallah ta'ala uh, continue, okay? وَإِذَا قُرِئَ Quran And when the Qur'an is recited, فَاسْتَمِئُوا لَهُ Listen to it. وَأَنصِتُوا And be quiet. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ If you do this, Allah will have mercy upon you. Meaning, now I want to come out of legalities into just a point of, of uh, something for myself and for everyone. That if you listen to the Qur'an when you are in salah, then لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Perhaps Allah will have mercy upon you. لَعَلَّكُمْ means not that perhaps, but when a king says perhaps we will do this, meaning it will happen. The perhaps of the king is reality. Uh, okay. Now another very uh, interesting uh, legal um, mechanism that's used within Islam is that the idea uh, that uh, Islam, the rules that Islam followed in the beginning were based upon the previous books. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ in the beginning used to pray towards, not Mecca, but towards Jerusalem. Because that was the Qibla of the people of the book. That was the proper Qibla. Okay, this is where Isa ﷺ, uh, where Prof Prophet Isa ﷺ was, and they used to pray towards the uh, Jerusalem. Now, the Prophet also prayed in, in towards Jerusalem until the time that uh, the verse Qumu Lillahi Qanitun was revealed. And the companions of the Prophet ﷺ used to, while praying, used to talk to one another, okay, until this verse was revealed. So a verse was revealed about changing the Qibla, right? Sayaqulu Sufaha min al Nasi, or when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fawalli wajhaka shatra al Masjid al Haram, the verse came down that changed the position to the back to the Kaaba to Mecca, okay, and so the Prophet started his Sharia doing according to the previous Sharias and then moved into his Sharia. Those things that remained the same, most of it remained the same. Most of the Sharia of the past was uh, also in the Sharia of Prophet Muhammad, but a few things were added to it, and one of them was changing the Qibla. One of the things that was allowed in the previous sharias is that while doing salah, while doing prayers, if they had a need, they were allowed to talk. They were allowed to talk until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, and it is known, well known in the traditions of the Prophet sallallahu If I start showing every hadith, it'll take too long, this discussion, because it's a long discussion. But it was well known that the companions of the Prophet used to talk to each other, each other until the ayah, Qumu Lillahi Qaniti, was revealed. And then the Prophet's companions stopped talking. Now, the point being here, 
that uh, they were told, now this is going to be an argument and then a counter argument, okay? So they were told that you're not allowed to talk during prayers, meaning you have to listen to the imam, okay? You have to follow the imam. Don't talk during prayers. And that included your own personal recitations or your own saying salams to someone or even a good thing that all was stopped and the counter to this is the argument that okay they were not allowed to talk but quran is not talking it is an ibadah it is a worship it is a form of worship and so reading quran as part of prayer was part of worshiping and so uh, the talking that was banned is not equal to you cannot read quran so here's another argument that can take place on this issue okay now there are many narrations on both sides okay because there's a debate about now even when there is a narration let's say there's a narration that sides with the opinion of Imam Shafi then the other schools of thought come and they criticize the narration the Asnad the Asanid you saw this in the beginning when one of the scholars was when we we're who was talking about in in was talking about the authenticity of a narration and then there are other uh, ahadiths. So, so, the, so when you're looking at a hadith, then you know many times the uh, the narration, the, who is the narrator, comes into uh, into uh, criticism by one group or the other. Now, what is important is that uh, also when you look at this issue, you have to realize in order now to have a bigger view of Islamic law from its historical perspective, is that. Uh, Medina, people in Medina did not recite Fatiha out loud uh, when the Imam was silent. And the people of Kufa, which became the Hanafi Mazhab, so you have Imam Malik and Imam Muhanifa, right? And you have these two as Darul Khilafa, meaning Medina was the center of Khilafa, and then Kufa was the center of Khilafa. Ali radiallahu anh moved to Kufa. And uh, it was, uh, there are narrations that say Ali radiallahu anh did not uh, read uh, Fatiha. Anyway, that's not the point. The whole of Kufa didn't read Fatiha. So both Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik agree that if the Imam is reading out loud, not to read Fatiha. Now on the contrast of that, because I'm trying to give both opinions, you have this hadith of Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu an, the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Uh, There's no prayer for the one who has not read Fatiha Tul Kitab. No prayer. It's a very now. Let's look at this hadith of the Prophet وسلم, Right? La salata. There it is in the form of a negation. Now, one of the higher forms of saying you have to not do something or do something is with the negation. La salat. There's no prayers. And whoever does not recite Fatiha Tul Kitab. So meaning Fatiha, Fatiha is a condition for the Salah. This is absolutely clear. Unequivocal wordings of the Prophet Okay. Now, in contrast to this again, because I'm trying to show both sides, right? So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in, it's not like the Prophet, it'd be good if you do it, or yes, you can do it, or <coughs> this is in the form of a command. So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'fallluha, let your beards grow. It's also a command, right? But we know it's not fard to have a beard. It's sunnah mu'akkidah to have a beard. It is wajib to have a beard. In the Hanafi opinion, wajib. Sunnah mu'akkidah. It is a sunnah of the, it's one of the good sunnahs of the Prophet to have a beard. But it is not fard. It is not an obligation. Even though the Prophet said it in the form of a command. Over here, la salata illa bi fatiatul kitab. Same thing. Is it that it's like the Prophet said, grow a beard? Where it's a command? It, where it's an in highly, highly encouraged that you should do it, it's definitely good to do it, but your prayers are still not invalid if you don't do it. Or is it that it is actually part of the prayer, you have to do it. So, Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal consider it to be actually part of the prayer of every rakah. Okay? Imam Jazari, who wrote uh, Fiqh al-Mazahib al-Arba, 
he says it's three against one. Meaning Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal have, he, he looks at Imam's, Imam Malik's opinion leaning more towards Imam Shafi's opinion or the Salafi opinion and then Imam Abu Hanifa is alone. Because Imam Abu Hanifa's opinion is also according to some of the authorities that not even Fatiha is required. Because the Quran says, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسْرَمِنْ Read from the Quran whatever little you can. And this could also be perhaps because in Imam Abu Hanifa's locality Kufa, there were many non-Muslims and many new Muslims. And so that had to be also reconciled. And sometimes the place of the Imam and the the uh, the situation that the Imam is in also takes it has to be taken into consideration when you are looking at their fatwa. This is also very important. You have to look at the historical context in which certain fatwas are being given. Um, now, in contrast to you have to read Fatiha in every salah is this hadith of uh, uh, Imam Daud إذا أمن إمام when the Imam says Ameen, when the Imam says Ameen, now that's a separate issue. Do you say Ameen out loud or not out loud? But everyone agrees you have to say it. When the Imam says Ameen, okay? وَإِذَا أَمَّنَ إِمَامٌ فَأَمْنَوْ فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ وَفِقَ تَأْمِينُهُ تَأْمِينَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ مِنْ ذَنْبِ So if you have to say Ameen with the Ameen of who? The Imam. Okay, so meaning if you say your own Fatiha, your ima, your Ameen will not be with the Imam. If you say your own Fatiha, your Ameen will not be with the Imam. Okay, and uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the Ahlul Hadith or the Salafi brothers, when you study with them, they'll say, see, they use the same Hadith that, look, you have to say Ameen with the Imam. Okay, meaning you have to read Fatiha with the Imam. You have to read Fatiha. And so when he says Amin, you're also saying Amin. Meaning you have to say Amin and the Imam has to say Amin. And the same hadith is being used, the same text is being used to make the two different points. Okay. Now, uh, now, uh, now regarding narrations, for example, one of the narrations that says not to read, Fatiha. Not to read Fatiha behind the Imam is the opinion of Abdullah bin Mas'ud who was in Kufa. And basically Kufa is the is the mazhab of Imam Ali uh, an, and uh, Ibn Mas'ud an. So the criticism on Ibn Mas'ud an, is that his memory became weak towards the end of his life. So how much can we rely on his statements? The counter to that is, so Ibn Mas'ud held the opinion or has been narrated to have said, don't read Fatiha behind the Imam. Okay, and because Abu Hanifa is from Kufa, Ibn Mas'ud is from Kufa, so this is where that opinion came from. But the criticism is that Ibn Mas'ud, his, his memory was weak. So what do we do with that? So, uh, so the Ibn Mas'ud had four students uh, and Two of them are from the earlier part of his life. Two of them are from the uh, latter part of his life. Okay, And so when you look at his students and the opinions of his students, like Ka'ab, for example, they also held, you don't read Fatiha behind the Imam. So now here is a very important point, which is that when you're looking at a person, like Ibn Mas'ud, a Sahabi, who knew the Prophet, and he is... It, the criticism, jar and ta'deel on him is that his memory was weak. How do you deal with that? Well, w one opinion is that, look, his memory is weak, so it's better not to touch that opinion or to take it very seriously because it goes against the other opinions, okay, which is that you have to read Fatiha behind the Imam. As we read, just read the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, saying you have to read Fatiha behind the Imam. Now, remember, the whole reason I'm doing this exercise is for you to appreciate the, intricacy, the intricacies of this whole debate, but, in, but I'm using this specific situation for you to appreciate the grander Islamic issues, okay? And not to be caught up in, oh, this mazhab says this, and this mazhab says this, and this, uh, the Hanafi say this, and the Salafi say this, and they do this. Usually, no matter what 
valid what mainstream if it's a mainstream opinion it probably has enough proof to be considered uh, to have some weight okay it's very rarely very very rarely that there'll be a mainstream opinion uh, amongst the four or five or six mazahibs however you want to look at it that will have an opinion that has absolutely no weight no weight when you're actually looking deeply into the issues okay so uh, Ibn Mas'ud has a weak memory. Uh, Sheikh Sayyid Sabiq also mentions this in his uh, Fiqh Sunnah and, and others. But others have come back and said, look, he may have had weak memory towards the end of his life, but he certainly had students in the beginning of his, of his teaching when he had a strong memory uh, when he was in Kufa. And they also agree that Fatiha should not be read behind the Imam. Okay? So now, uh, the point here is not, again, to say which opinion is right or wrong. A lot of these secondary arguments, like for example, لا تباريد imam, Don't go in front of the imam, meaning don't try to go before the imam. Now obviously, uh, this applies at many levels. So the Prophet continues to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِذَا كَبِّرَ فَكَبِّرُ When he says, Allahu Akbar, say Allahu Akbar, إِذَا وَإِذَا قَالَ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ And when he says, وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Who says? The Imam says. When the Imam says, وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ So who's reading the Qur'an? The Imam is reading Qur'an on behalf of the people. Right? قَالُوا amin. So you people behind say, Ameen. وَإِذَا رَكَعَ فَرْكَعُوا When he does ruku, you do ruku. وَإِذَا قَالَ سَمِيَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ حَمِدَ فَقَالُوا اللَّهُمَّ رَبَّنَا لَكَ الْحَمْدُ Okay? The point being, the argument is, well, the Prophet told you what to do, and he did not say the imams, uh, the, the, the people that are behind the imam to read Fatiha. Okay? The, <coughs> the counter-argument, of course, is, and also the argument is, that the imam says, والضالين, meaning he's reading Fatiha, and the people behind are told to say, Amin, with the imam, meaning with the imam's Fatiha. Okay? Now, the counter-argument is that, well, this excludes many things. It doesn't include, uh, you know, the thana. It does not include saying Bismillah before Fatiha. It does not include a lot of things. So, you know, this is talking about what it's talking about, but it's not necessarily talking about everything. And it's talking about the how you have to be with the Imam. So you can still read Fatiha and still say Amin with the Imam. Okay? So this is one of the uh, side arguments. And the point I make this is to show that the same hadith can be looked at from different perspectives depending upon who you are. Now we have another hadith. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا صلاة لمن لم يكره في كل ركعة الحمد لله صورة فريضة أو غيرها. Now, I'm going to show you how sometimes different interpretations lead to different conclusions. So one conclusion is, that لا صلاة لمن لم يكره في كل ركعة الحمد لله There's no salah for the one who does not read in every ركعة الحمد لله رب العالمين Meaning سورة الفاتحة Okay في فريضة أو غيرها Whether it is an obligatory prayer Or if it is a, like a, a non-obligatory Like a sunnah or a nafal prayer You have to read Fatiha Okay Now one way to interpret this, like I said, is that in every salah, you have to read, every raka'ah, you have to read Fatiha. The other interpretation of this hadith says, لا صلاة لمن, لمن يقرأ في كل ركع, الحمد لله, is that, uh, that no matter what type of prayer it is, meaning it could be a janazah prayer, it could be a stisqa prayer, it could be a fard prayer, because the Prophet said, if it is a obligatory prayer, meaning the five prayers, okay, and any other prayer, meaning other types of prayers, meaning if it is Salatul Istikhara, if it is if it is uh, Salatul, uh, you know, uh, Istisqa, uh, if it is um, Salatul Tasbih even, right? And no matter what prayer it is, it has to include Fatiha in it, okay? And the argument is not about if you have to read Fatiha behind the Imam or not. Whereas the other group will say, no, 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 this is clear proof. You have to read Fatiha behind the Imam. Now, so this is, 
I'm giving you different dimensions of how these debates go between the different schools so that you can have an appreciation. And uh, so let me show you another verse of the Quran. In the last verse of Surah Al-Muzammil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now this is an interesting debate because first of all, you always have the debate if the ayah is revealed in Mecca or Medina. Okay, this last verse most likely was revealed in Medina. That is besides the point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ And read what is easy of the Qur'an. And so some of the scholars said Qur'an here means Al-Fatiha. Because why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is called Surah Al-Fatiha Qur'an Al-Azim. Okay? Uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَكَ وَلَكَدْ آتَيْنَكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ We gave you the seven repeated verses, the seven verses that are oftenly repeated, and the great Qur'an. So Qur'an is meaning Fatiha. مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Whatever is easy of Qur'an, meaning أي فاتحة, read of that. Meaning, it is an obligation to read from Fatiha uh, when you are in Salah. And why salah? Because the verse before is talking about in Rabbaka ya'lamu annaka takumu adna min thuluth al-layli wa nisfahu wa thuluth wa ta'ifatu min al-ladhina ma'ak. This is talking about prayer time. Okay? Not just general reading of Qur'an. So this is one way of interpreting it. فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ and ease, read e, what is easy from reading the Qur'an and establish the prayer. Meaning, Qur'an, as discussed within Qur'an, is referring to Surah Al-Fatiha. And then the other group will come and say, no, مَا تَيَسْرَ مِنَ Qur'an means any part of Qur'an. Whether it is Fatiha or any other part of Qur'an, you have to read it. It's not an obligation. Because over here, فَقْرَأُوا is a command. And it's a command in Qur'an. Like, وَرَكَعُوا وَسْجُدُوا Bow down and do sujood. You have to do sujood. Without that, you know, you your prayer is uh, deficient. فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسْرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ So definitely read part of... But the the counter-argument to that is that they say, oh, this is any part of Qur'an. The other counter-argument is مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ A part of the Qur'an. Meaning, you don't read the whole of Fatiha, you read part of the Fatiha. But they say, this is min za'i that maybe, like this is a min that includes all of... And you have an example of min za'i that in other famous verses of the Qur'an too. So this is one way of looking at how the arguments work legally, non-legally. First of all, you're looking for a command. Second of all, you're looking at the time. Second of all, third of all, you're looking if it's a madni or a makki surah, right? You're looking at all these things. And uh, and this verse of the Quran that I just presented to you earlier, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنِ And when the Quran is revealed, I mean, when the Quran is recited, فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Listen to it. وَأَنصِتُوا And be quiet. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So Allah may have mercy upon you. Well, this surah is still araf And still araf is Makki. And in Makki, uh, there was uh, there is the argument that there was no really Salatul Jama'ah that happened after Mi'raj. Even though, then that is contested with the hadith about the jinns. That the Prophet was doing Salatul Jama'ah when the jinns heard him doing Salatul Jama'ah and heard the Qur'an. And that's when Allah says, we heard a very strange, beautiful, delightful Qur'an. We heard, so that's, the same thing, listen to it. So, this is a Makki ayah, and there's no Salatul Jama'ah. And uh, even though there is a con counter argument, yes, there used to be Salatul Jama'ah, because even though there were not now five time prayers, but there were at least two jama'as, two salahs that used to take place in the Makki period before Mi'raj, then it was increased to five. The point is that this is a Makki verse of the Qur'an and therefore this cannot apply to the rulings of prayer because this is not talking about them. This is talking about the non-Muslims are being told when the Qur'an is being recited, listen to it and be quiet, don't try to interfere in what is being conveyed to you from Allah, on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So this is the other interpretation. Even though, to be fair, I have to say that there are many, many scholars 
okay, who have talked about the fact that this verse is actually revealed in Medina. When we say, and according to uh, one opinion, when we say that a certain verse is Makki or Madni, we mean majority of the surah is one opinion, or the beginning of the ayat is the other opinion, or so some scholars say if the beginning of the verses are in Makkah or Medina, then, the, then there may be some verses, like Surah Al-Hajj and other examples, where, or Surah Al-Muzammil I just discussed, where some of the verses may have been, uh, in, even though majority of the surah was revealed in Makkah, but some part of it was revealed in Medina. Okay, so then another thing is we look at the riwayah because the Prophet and the Quran are the standard, but how did the companions of the Prophet وسلم, interpret and understand Islam as a whole and the interpretation of, of everything? So in this case, when we're looking at Fatiha, for example, Umar radiallahu anh, when he gathered people for the Taraweeh prayers, he said, Ala qari'in wahidin, with one reciter of Quran. We will gather people under one reciter of Quran. So this goes for the idea that the Imam is reading Quran on behalf of the people behind him and the people are listening, okay? Uh, uh, so, uh, the the statement here, Quran, but the counter argument to this argument is, well, yes, when you, the, you're reading behind the Imam in uh, Salat al-Taraweeh, the Qira is out loud and so therefore, you know, the people can choose to uh, read Fatiha or not read Fatiha, but but the point here is that the the Ahlul Hadith argument is you have to read Fatiha every rakah. But over here, Umar radiAllahu anhu is saying, "Ala qariin wahidin." We'll put together people behind Yajbaun Nas, "Ala qari wara'ul qari wahid," with one reciter of Quran. We'll put him behind. So when you look at this narration, it seems to say and suggest that there will be one person who's reading Quran, and every one will be listening behind him, right? So this gives the uh, the the opinion of Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa in this case. Um, the point again being not who's right and not who's wrong, but to give you an idea of the type of arguments and the level and the sophistication of the arguments that are given on behalf of one opinion or the other opinion. Of course, the counter argument is that that was bil jahr that was out loud. So, you know, that's one argument. But the other argument is that just because the Imam is reading out loud doesn't mean we don't have to read it ourselves because the Prophet said, لا صلاة إلا بفاتحة There is no salah without reading Fatiha to kitab without reading the, the, the chapter of Fatiha. So, um, so the arguments like this, they continue. Now, of course, when we talk about this particular verse of the Qur'an, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ Quran, When the Qur'an is recited, right? So, when you say this, now, the word Qur'i'a, uh, one of the arguments is, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ Quran, And when the Qur'an is recited, it refers to reciting out loud, even though I have to say, um, I feel this is a relatively weaker opinion. But Qur'i'a Quran means when it's recited out loud, uh, but uh, the other definition of Qur'i'a, recited, means when you, and in case you don't know this, you should know this, that when you are reading Qur'an or when you're reading Salah, there is, you have to move your tongue. Okay, so when you're reading Fatiha, let's say, in your individual prayers, you can't just imagine it, you can't just uh, be silent. You have to read with your tongue, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, whether silently or out loud. So, Qira is the moving of the tongue according to the makharij, according to the right places, uh, and the moving of the tongue uh, according to the rules of tajweed. This is qira. Okay. So, um, so one opinion is wa idha quri al Quran. This is referring to out loud prayers. But the other opinion is no. This is not referring to out loud prayers. This is referring to any prayer, even a silent prayer. So when the imam recites Quran silently, okay, this is still him reciting Quran uh, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on behalf of the people that are behind him. But then, like I said, you have the very strong uh, narration that the Prophet says there's no salah without Fatiha, right? So these are the issues that uh, legalists have to deal with. Then you have narrations that are like in the middle, okay? Giving, giving preference to reading Fatiha, but not making it mandatory. 
which comes in contrast to the saying of the Prophet, فَقْرَأُوا مَا مَنْ لَمْ يَقْرَأْ فَاتِحَةُ الْكِتَابِ Whoever didn't read فَاتِحَةُ الْكِتَابِ لَا صَلَاةَ لِمَنْ لَا يَقْرَأْ فَاتِحَةُ الْكِتَابِ Okay, over here, it has been said that كَانَ مَحُولٌ يَقْرَأُوا فِي الْمَغْرِبِ وَالْعِشَاءَ وَالصُّبْحَ بِالْفَاتِحَةِ الْكِتَابِ بِكُلِّ رَاكَعَةٍ مَخُول used to recite سُوتُ الْفَاتِحَةِ okay in the prayer in which the Imam recites the Quran loudly okay he used to recite Fatiha silently to himself so here you have a situation where even though the Quran says وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ قُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ Listen to the Quran when it is recited out loud but a tabi'i is saying or it is being said about a tabi'i that Ubadah ibn Samit and other versions of that day they say that Mahul used to recite Fatiha quietly in the prayer when the Imam recites the Quran loudly when he observes the period of silence okay now when is the period of silence? Uh, this could be after saying Wala Dhalin Amin, according to some of the uh, traditions. And it uh, could be after he says Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, then he stays quiet for the period of Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, then he stays quiet for the period of Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. This is in accordance to the Hanbali Mazhab. Okay? So the Imam recites Quran loudly when he observes the period of silence. If he does not observe the period of silence, recite it before him or along with him or after him, but do not give it up. Okay, do not give it up. Over here, for example, when you have narrations like this, they tell you what can be done, what should be done, but they don't give you a legal verdict as in a command. Because when we talk about a legal verdict, we are talking about a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? We are talking about these issues. I'm, uh, I'm not talking about just fatiha. These same principles then apply to a whole group of things. When you're reading a hadith, you are looking at okay, does it give us a command? Is it real, or is it, is, or is it just an encouragement? If it's encouragement, it has nothing to do with the minimum requirements, right? So just keep that in mind. So another hadith narration. Uh, in which Abu Huraira radiallahu an, he adds his own interpretation to the text. The Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, man salla salatan lam yakrah fiha ummu al-Quran, fahiya khidajun ghairi tamam." Okay, so, so. Uh, The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever does not read Fatiha, his prayer is deficient. Now, this is what the Prophet is saying. Man salata lam yakra fiha ummul Quran. Whoever doesn't read ummul Quran, meaning Fatiha, fahiya khidajun ghayr tamam. Then it is not complete, it is deficient. Okay? And he says, khidajun, it is deficient. And then ghayr tamam, it is not complete. And then, فَقُلْتُ يَا أَبُوْ هُرَيْرَ إِنِّي أَكُونُ أَحْيَانٌ وَرَاءُ الْإِمَامِ He said, well, I'm behind, you know, the person who's asking Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه, right? That uh, he, he said that uh, I'm sometimes behind the Imam, okay? فَقُلْتُ يَا أَبُوْ هُرَيْرَ إِنِّي أَكُونُ أَحْيَانٌ وَرَاءُ الْإِمَامِ قَالَ يَا فَارْسِي إِكْرَأْ بِهَا فِي نَفْسِك Oh, فَارْسِي Read the Fatiha behind the Imam in your own self, fi nafsik, okay? Meaning silently to yourself, okay? So this is the opinion that uh, that Abu Hurairah. Now you can take this narration to mean two things. Fi nafsik can mean read silently, meaning as you do qira, can do qira silently, but it can also mean just read inside yourself. Now, if you say inside yourself, you're not contra contradicting the verse of the Quran. When the Quran is recited out loud, listen to it because you can read silently in yourself with the Imam, right? But you cannot be reading your own Fatiha and also be listening to the Fatiha, Fatiha of the Imam and, and following that verse that says, And be quiet, don't move your tongue. 
Don't move your tongue, right? وَأَنْسِتُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ And be quiet, and so you will have mercy. A mercy will be given to you. Now again, what is the point of all of this? The point of all of this is to explain to you, or to show to you, or to demonstrate to you that the scholars, number one, went in great depth. Number two, even though they went in great depth, and that was a necessary thing at that time, but today we are in a position to appreciate what they did. But we are not in a position to, uh, to create conflict over what the different opinions. That is wrong. The, it is, and then understanding that all of these different opinions, they actually seem to merge with one common opinion uh, in, in which there is a commonality. It is, Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not the meat of the sacrifice that reaches Allah. It's not the legalities that meet, meet Allah. It is the taqwa. It is the fear of Allah. It is the God consciousness that meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why even though the ruh needs a body, the, 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 the spirit in order to manifest itself needs a structure but the ruh in the structure is the main thing. And these debates, they are, according to the situation today, these are not the times to be debating these things. But it is this time to express to people, hey, this is not the time to debate these things. These things have been debated and debated and deeply deba debated. To the, but we are in a place where we can appreciate these differences of opinions and these difference of uh, istimbat, reaching different legal conclusions, even though we're all using the same text. And to have this opinion that other people don't know what they're talking about, they have no dalil, they have no proof, and I know for sure, 99.999% who says another people within Islam are wrong, has never studied with them, never actually been with them, has never actually spent time with them, has never even taken the time to 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 engage them in a, in a positive uh, manner okay so bismillah so now continuing this issue uh, of reading fatiha behind the imam so for example there's a hadith i will show you and then i will show you the response to that hadith the prophet said sallallahu alaihi wasallam man kana lahu imamun whoever has an imamun fa inna kiraatul imam lahu kiraatun then the qira, the recitation of the imam, is for the person who is behind the imam. Okay, and uh, in in this way, uh, there is a little bit of a history that I can share with you. That sometimes the companions of the Prophet sallallahu would read the Quran with with the Prophet, meaning he's reading uh, whether he's reading Surah Al-Fatiha or a surah after that. The companions would be reading Quran with the Prophet, and the Prophet told them to stop. Now, this stopping uh, has two opinions. One opinion is that it included the stopping of everything, and the other opinion is that it included only the stopping of the surah, not Fatiha. The, the, the other opinion is that it included stopping of the surah, but in terms of the permission was given to read Fatiha, okay? In another hadith, uh, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yaqulu, uh, it has uh, been narrated by Nafi uh, on uh, Abdullah bin Umar, who was basically in Medina. Therefore, the the position of Imam Malik, right? Uh, Umar used to not recite behind the Imam. So the son of Umar, radiyallahu an, okay, uh, Abdullah bin Umar, la yakra'u khalful Imam. He used to not recite behind the Imam, uh, and it was uh, heard. Yahya said that he heard Malik say the position with us is this is that uh, recites whoever recites behind the Imam when the Imam does not recite aloud and he refrains from reciting when the Imam recites out loud okay he doesn't recite when the Imam is out loud and uh, in the same way yakana uh, yakra'u khalful Imam فِيمَا لَا جَحْرَ فِي إِمَامَ بِالْكِرَعَةِ Okay, uh, Uyayn uh, Hashim bin Urwa, that his father used to recite behind the Imam when the Imam did not recite out loud. Okay, and this is the position of Imam Malik. Okay, 
and uh, uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, uh, he asked Zayd ibn Thabit about reciting with the Imam. He said there is no recitation with the Imam in anything. And he claimed that he had recited uh, by, this, uh, by, the, uh, by the star when it goes down uh, to the, and he did not uh, prostrate. Uh, so anyway, one najmi ida hawa. So he's talking about a certain surah that you do not recite. Uh, be, he said there is no recitation with the imam in anything. Meaning, when the imam is reciting, his reciting is the recitation. Now, in uh, in in contrast to this, you can re you read this. Uh, the uh, here, let me show you this. Uh, the uh, so the so the Ahlul Hadith or the Zahiri Mazhab or the Salafi brothers will say that the Hadith that we just read about the Kira of the Imam is the Kira of the followers. This is a weak Hadith. So uh, so um, so this is uh, something about that. There is no prayer for the one who does not recite the opening of the books. Thus we may reconcile. Uh, the evidence, okay. The recitation of the, the the hadith, the recitation of the imam is the recitation of the one who is praying behind him is da'if, is weak, okay. So this is how the arguments go back and forth, back and forth. Now over here, I want to mention something important, and that is that uh, also this uh, gives a credence to the Hanafi mazhab. But I'm not here uh, promoting one mazhab or the other. I'm just simply saying what are the strong evidences. When you bring everything together uh, from just a logical point of view, Imam Malik has the middle point of view, right? And, uh, but this does prove, give what I'm about to say, give credence to the Hanafi point of view. And you'll see how the debates continue. So the Hanafi point of view is uh, that, that, or not the Hanafi, but all of the Fuqaha agree that if you catch the Ruku'ah of a prayer, right? If you catch the Ruku'ah, if the Imam is already and everyone is already read Fatiha and you join the prayer in the Ruku'ah, then you caught the Ruku'ah and you caught therefore the Fatiha because the Imam read your Fatiha. So the minimal, the legal opinion is you don't have to read behind the Imam because he's reading for you and his Fatiha suffices for you. This is the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa. You don't read anything, right? Uh, and uh, read from the Quran, whatever is easy. Okay, and the reading of the Imam is the reading of for the for the people, right? And the opinion of Imam Malik is more based upon the verse wa idha quri al Quran when Quran is recited out, meaning when you can hear the Quran, uh, when it is recited out loud is understood, meaning wa idha quri al Quran, meaning out loud or when Quran is read. Silently or out loud. The other debate is, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنَ This is talking about prayers or this is talking about any time in prayer or outside prayer. وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَمِئُوا لَهُ وَأَنصِتُوا So then listen to it carefully and be quiet. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So that Allah will have mercy upon. If it's referring to prayers, then qira is qira whether it is out loud or silent. Right? So this is the type of uh, debates that uh, they get into. And then let me show you this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Now there are, I think, two or three narrations like this one, right? Uh, again, مَن لَمْ يَكْ مَن, مَن صَلَّ صَلَاةً Whoever prayed a prayer, وَلَمْ يَكْرَى فِيهَا أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ أُمُّ الْقُرْآنِ Sorry, whoever didn't read part of the Qur'an or the mother of the Qur'an, meaning Fatiha, فَهِيَ خِدَاجٌ It is insufficient. ثَلَاثَ so the Prophet said this three times. It is insufficient. It is insufficient. It is insufficient. غير تمام Not being completed. فقيل لأبي هريرة إن كنا وراء الإمام فقرأوا فقرأ بي في نفسك Read uh, to yourself lightly. فإني سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم And now the proof that is given that you should recite Fatiha is the proof of this hadith 
in which the Prophet said "Qasamtu salata baini wa baina abdi I have said, I've divided the prayer Allah said Allah says I've divided the prayer into two parts and everybody knows the rest of the hadith right nifsain uh, then qasamtu uh, salata baini wa baina abdi nifsain li abdi ma sa'al wa li abdi ma sa'al and for my servant is whatever he asks wa idha qala abdu alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin qala azza wa jal hamadani abdi and it continues so when he says alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Allah says my servant has praised me so this is coming under the uh, uh, the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu and with the the, this is used as proof you have to read Fatiha because if you say this then you get this response right but then the other response to this is yes this happens but it is not uh, happening in the Fard Salah per se but this is for the individual Salahs this in the Salah of the individual okay so you get my point here right and so what is the other thing I want to uh, share with you right is if you look at uh, uh, Now why am I talking about this? Because I want to share with you that instead of having a strong opinion one way or the other, the ulama of the past, they had a much broader, much more flexible, much more dynamic, much more uh, understanding of the position of the other, of the other side. So, uh, uh, so this, like for example, is the chapter in Qiratul Fatiha of the four mazhabs, right? What is their opinion and why? Yattallat bil Qur'an Fatiha mubahith ahadahuma. So he says, you know, regarding the reading of Fatiha, there are different uh, discourses, different disputes, different issues, right? The first of them is Hal hiya fard fi fi salah bil ittifaq jami'il mazhab. Uh, do all the mazahibs agree that this is Fatiha is it is is an obligatory meaning uh, whether the Imam is reading it for you or you're reading it for yourself or you're reading it with the Imam during the spaces that he uh, the sakta after what uh, Dalin Amin then there is a sakta in the Shafi'i mazhab you have to stay quiet to let everybody read or like I said before the Imam reads Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and he gives you space to read Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So during the Sakta, you read whether one way or the other, whether you whether the Imam's reading for you or you're reading for yourself and everything in between, do you have to read Fatiha? So this is the question, right? Thanihima and the second of it, Hadhi Afard fi Jami Rakat Salah, Sawa Akanat Salat and Fardan Aw Nafilan. So this is the second question he asks. The point I'm trying to make, I'm not going to read this whole thing. But he fard jami is rakat. Do you have to read Fatiha for every rakat? Right? And then, so I can at salat and fardan or nafilan. Even if it's a salat that's fard obligatory on you or nafilan, if it is just a nafil, an extra prayer, like you're doing sunnah prayers or some other prayers, do you have to read Fatiha in even in every rakat? Okay? Because then the issue comes that how come when you join a salat in rakur? And you haven't read Fatiha, how do you uh, reconcile that? And the Hanafi Mazhab obviously reconciles this situation better than the other Mazahibs, in the sense that the Hanafi Mazhab says, well, the Imam read your uh, Kira'a, he read your Fatiha, and that's why when you go into Ruku, it's counted as Ruku because he read it for you. And you have up to Ruku to catch that Raka'ah, okay, that, that unit of prayer. So, ثالثاً هي هي فرض على كل مصلي سواء كانت يصلي من منفرداً أو كان يصلي إماماً أو مأموناً. And this is clear too. You know, is this هل هي فرض؟ Is it فرض على كل مصلي؟ Every person who prays, سواء كانت يصلي منفرداً, even if he's praying alone, أو كانت يصلي إماماً, or even if he prays as an imam or مأموم or somebody behind the imam. Okay. رابعاً ما حكم العاجز عن قراءات الفاتحة؟ What will happen to the person who, for example, doesn't have a throat or doesn't have a tongue or he can't read Fatiha? He's he's not he's he's joining the prayer, but he doesn't have the ability. He's dumb, let's say, to read Fatiha. You know what will be that person's position? Okay. خامس خامس تها هل يشترط في قراءة الفاتحة أن يسمع القارئ بها نفسه؟ So it continues. The point I'm trying to make is the scholars of the past were a lot more authentic, a lot more deep, a lot more, uh, you could say, thinking about what they are 
uh, deliberating over. And what we have today is these, uh, you know, it's like, uh, I'll give you an example, okay? That, uh, you know, any, any scholar, uh, you know, he has his opinions and the people that are following that scholar or have a good opinion about that scholar, sometimes the people that are following him have a higher opinion of his opinions more than he has of himself. Okay, so, uh, and then that leads to a situation where you don't have the, uh, the capacity to listen to someone other than the imam that you agree with. And this is one of the curses that has touched us in this time. That first of all, we're getting in these debates that have already been settled. Settled in the sense that as much as it could be settled, right? There's no unity of Islamic legalities because there's a difference of opinions on the asuls, the principles. Like I said, Imam Shafi'i will take the hadith, la salata liman la yakrahu fatihatul kitab, with the eye of the Quran. That who reading the Fatiha seven, with the seven most repeated verses. He'll take the hadith that directly connects to Quran and put them as equal. This is why I think in the Shafi'i Mashab there are 13 arkan, 13 things you have to do in Salah because of this, this system that Imam Shafi'i came up with. Imam Abu Hanifa has five things you have to do in Salah. Okay? And so, uh, you know, uh, so the point here is that there is. The, there, as much as we could have resolved it, we resolved it. And no imam can be considered this is wrong opinion, and the Hanafis are wrong, the Salafis are right, or, you know, this, this is just plain stupidity and plainly not understanding what is the position of the other side. Like, I've tried to show you that the, all the sides have proofs. They may argue about what is weak, what is strong, what is the exact meaning of this, does this, in, it, does this refer to prayers or it doesn't refer to prayers. All those things are there, but you can't say the other side is baseless. You can't say that, okay? And so, if you look at, for example, look at, for example, Badayatul Mujtahid, right? Uh, if you look at Badayatul Mujtahid, um, the description of the... Um, what the Imam performs on behalf of the follower, okay? So what the Imam performs on behalf of the follower. They agree that there is no exemption is granted to the follower from the obligations of prayer except for recitation. Meaning you have to do everything the Imam is doing uh, except in the issue of recitation. If he's, saying, if he's in Ruku, you have to do the things of Ruku. If he's in Sujood, you have to do the things of Sujood. If he's in saying Samiyallahu liman hamida, you have to uh, follow up with your part of it, right? Rabbana uh, lakal hamd. And uh, so if you're in at tahiyat if you're in Jalsa, you have to read the Tashhad, you have to say the Salams upon the Prophet. So he's saying, they agreed that, and this is Badayatul Mujtahid, I'm just reading, reading the English translation. They agreed that there is, that no exception is granted to the follower from the obligations of prayer except for the recitation. They disagreed about this, meaning the recitation, by the follower holding three opinions. First, some held the follower should undertake his recitation behind the imam in prayers with inaudible recitation, but he should not recite behind him when the recitation is audible to him. Obviously, Badayat al-Mujtahid is written by a Maliki, so he mentions that first, which is that when the Qira'a is not out loud, you can read Fatiha, and when the Qira'a is out loud, you don't, you, when the Qira'a is out loud, you don't read Fatiha. When the Qur'an is, when the recitation of Fatiha is silent, like Dhuhr and Asr, you, you should read Fatiha, okay? And then he continues, uh, uh, but he should recite behind him when the recitation is audible to him. Second, that he should not recite behind the Imam at all. So this is the opinion of the Ihnaf, the Hanafis. You don't have to recite behind the Imam because uh, the proof is, the Prophet said, whatever the Imam recites, the people have, uh, he's recited on behalf of the people. And the proof of that is when you go into Ruku' and uh, you didn't read Fatiha, your prayer is counted, right? Second is that he should not recite behind the Imam at all. Third is that he should recite the Ummul Kitab and the rest, in the rest of the cases, in the, in the case of the prayers with inaudible recitation, only, and only the Ummul Kitab in the case of the audible recitation, okay? So he, should read Fatiha, okay? He that he should recite Ummul Kitab and the rest 
in the case of prayers with inaudible recitation. So one opinion is he should read Fatiha and a Surah if you cannot hear the Imam going uh, reading out loud. And if you hear the Imam out loud, then only Umul Kitab in the case of prayers where the recitation is audible. If you can hear the recitation, then only read Fatiha. Okay, this is another opinion. Some made a distinction between the case of the prayers with audible recitation when the follower can hear the Imam's recitation and when he cannot hear him. Meaning, even if the Imam is reciting out loud, there's a difference of opinion. The Imam is reciting out, but you can't hear him. What to do in that case? Okay. Thus, they made recitation obligatory for him when he cannot hear the Imam, but they prohibited him from doing so when he can hear the Imam. The first view is held by Imam Malik, except that he preferred the recitation in the case of inaudible recitation. Okay. Imam Malik preferred, not, as you remember, that Ibn Umar, the son of Umar, when he was in Medina, he taught not to read Sayyid Fatiha. Okay? So, and you find the ahadith of Abu Hurairah that we went over that he said, the Prophet said to recite it. Okay? So, except that he preferred recitation in the case of inaudible recitation. The second opinion was Abu Hanifa, and in the third, Imam Shafi. And Ahmed bin Hanbal made the distinction between the situation where the follower is able to hear the Imam's recitation and the situation where he is not. The reason for this disagreement stems from the conflict of traditions on this topic and the interpretation on some of the bases of the others. There are four traditions on the topic. The first is the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, there is no prayer except with Fatihatul Kitab, which we've been through that now. This is in addition to the traditions conveying the same meaning which we have discussed under the issue of the obligation of recitation. The second is a tradition recorded by Malik from Abu Huraira that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, finished his prayer reciting in an audible voice and said, Did any of you recite with me just now? A man said, Yes, I did, Messenger of Allah وسلم. He said, I say, uh, he said, I say, how am I being challenged in the recitation of the Quran? The people stopped reciting while praying behind the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Meaning it bothered the Prophet that somebody else is reading Qur'an while he's reciting Qur'an. When the recitation was made in an audible voice. The third is the tradition of uh, Ubada ibn Thamith. Uh, uh, Thab, uh, Sam, who said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led us in the morning prayer and the recitation became difficult for him. <coughs> when he finished, he said, I see that you recite behind the Imam. We said, yes. He said, do it, do not do it, except for Ummul Kitab, except for Ummul Quran, okay, meaning Fatiha. Abu Umar said that the tradition of Ubada here is a narration from Mukhl. We went over, I showed you the Hadith of Mukhl, okay. And other narrations have continuous change and are authentic. The fourth tradition is of Jabir from the Prophet ﷺ who said, the recitation of a person who has an imam leading him is undertaken by the imam. So this I showed you this too. That the imam does the recitation on behalf of the people behind him. There's also a fifth tradition that is declared authentic by Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. It is the narration that reports the Prophet as saying, when the imam recites, listen silently. Okay. The jurists disagreed about the manner of reconciling these traditions. There were some who exempted the recitation of Ummul Kitab alone. It's meaning uh, you don't have to recite Ummul Kitab, Fatiha, right? From the prescription of the recitation during an audible recitation, meaning when the Imam is reciting out loud, you don't have to recite. Okay? On the basis of the tradition of uh, Ubadha ibn Samit, there are also who exempted from general implication of the words, there is no prayer without Fatiha tul Kitab. Only the case of the follower in a prayer with audible recitation because of the prohibition of the recitation in a prayer with audible recitation occurring in the tradition of Abu Hurairah. Now, when the, Allah says, uh, when the, the opinion, they cannot uh, recite Fatiha because the Fatiha is being read by the Imam out loud, the Hanafi would say, Qira is Qira, out loud or not. And so this is their argument, part of it. Okay? Uh, and uh, then it says, uh, Abu Hurairah, they supported this with the words of the exalted, and when the Quran is recited, give ear to it and pay heed uh, that ye may have obtained mercy. Now, what is the proof that it is out loud? Meaning, in this verse, it is talking about out loud because it is saying, listen to it carefully. Can't. 
it's not going to tell you to listen to an imam's voice that is inaudible, right? Meaning it, this ayah is not referring to qira'a uh, when it is not, you cannot hear it. وَأَنْسِتُ And be quiet so that you can hear. So Allah will have mercy upon you, right? So this is the proof that uh, this verse is not talking about prayers like Dhuhr and Asr, okay? Uh, some of them exempted from uh, the obligatory recitation of the follower in the group of prayers. Whether the prayer was inaudible or audible recitation, they confined the obligation of recitation to the cases of the Imam and the single worshipper taking into the account of tradition of Jabir. This is the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, meaning when you're alone, you have to read Fatiha, but when you're with the Jama'ah, you don't have to read. This is the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, thus the recitation of Jabir became for him an evidence of restricting the words of the Prophet Wasallam. recite whatever you can. <coughs> for he does not specify the recitation of Umul Qur'an in the prayer, meaning uh, the, the obligation to read Fatiha, uh, in the Qur'an when it says, uh, read from the Quran whatever is easy meaning the Imam will do it on your behalf and does not make reading Fatiha itself an obligation Okay, but he does prescribe the recitation of any Quranic passage as explained earlier the tradition of Jabir however related was marfu meaning reaching the Prophet but without a, a, a person a Sahabi only through the Asnad of uh, Jabir al-Jufi and there is no force in tradition related as marfu through him alone. Abu Omar said it is a tradition that is not deemed authentic except marfu narration of Jabir. Okay. Now, so this is how the traditional scholars of Islam dealt with these situations compared to the way we are dealing with them today because they understood these opinions that uh, you know, you should, you take the opinion of your mazhab or your teacher or whatever fits your heart. And these are not the bigger issues. The ummah has much, because we've debated these issues for over a thousand years, as you know. And we've come to a full cognizant understanding of the valid opinions based upon all the arguments. And so I'm presenting this to us so that, number one, you can uh, uh, appreciate the legalities in Islam. This is a strong, it's a rich, it's a dynamic, it's a diverse tradition. It's like you go to a garden, you see colors of flowers of different colors. You can appreciate that. Appreciate the difference of opinions and understand it's the ruh, the spirit behind it that's the main thing. The, legal, the legalism gives you a certain body, but you need the spirit in the body. And we're so much focused on the outer aspects of things, the legalisms of things that we have lost the spirit within.